Good afternoon, everyone. It's wonderful to see you for our third session um, of Stars of David. We are joined by, again, Rabbi Moeller, our wonderful facilitator, and our hosts, Robin and Susan. As a reminder, your hand, please do so virtually so that we can see the order in which hands are raised and uh, make sure we, we can see them without having to look at all the different um, pictures. Uh, if you have any questions, you can type them in the chat box as well, um, or you can just wait until we open it up for questions. I, uh, I hope you all have a wonderful session, and we have one more session following this next Wednesday at 1 p.m. And I'll turn it over now to Rabbi Muller. Thank you, Rabbi Boxman. All right, let me do everybody except for you. Hang on. Wait a minute, where'd you go? All right, unmute, Rabbi. Okay. okay, can you hear me? Yep, we're good. All right, hello everyone. Glad you could join us uh, this afternoon. Uh, we have a very interesting session ahead uh, with two quite well-known personalities. Uh, one uh, may not be as well-known, uh, but we're going to uh, look today at the Jewish identities of Larry King, David Copperfield, and Katie Martin in, in that order. And I, I switched the order a little bit because the, uh, the story surrounding Katie Martin is quite compelling. And um, her chapter was actually uh, the longest one in the book. So there's a lot of material there. We're gonna do that last. And then Arlene is going to provide us with a little background on uh, what Katie Martin has been doing since the publication of the book. All right, so let's begin with Lawrence Harvey Zeiger. That uh, is the name that uh, Larry King was born with on November 19th, 1933. He is still living. He is 86 years old and resides in Brooklyn. Right away, when you read the chapter, you kind of take, you're kind of taken aback with his first line, uh, which is, I always liked the Shiksas. That's what he said right off the bat. He's been married seven times twice to the same woman. And uh, why so many times has he been married? He says in his day, nobody lived together first. Uh, they just got married. So I guess, you know, when you can't live together, you end up getting married seven times. I, I don't know about that, but he says that he only has loved three women in his lifetime, which isn't so bad. Uh, so he talks about the three women in his life uh, that he actually loved, so I guess, uh, in the beginning of his career, he, he got married and maybe he wasn't so sure because he married young, but none of them were Jewish. And uh, the author, Abigail Pogrebin, asked him right off the bat, does it, does it bother you that uh, the, the women you've been married to were all Gentile? And he said, no, he never thinks about it. And that actually there are a lot of links between Catholics and Jews. That's how, that's how he felt. Did his mother care? And he said, Larry said he had no pressure from his uh, mother, although she would have preferred that he marry somebody Jewish. Uh, in the end, it didn't really matter. His current wife, uh, Sean Southwick King, and that, that is a woman, Sean, uh, she is a devout Mormon. And she believes that, uh, excuse me. Okay, I need, my, I need my phone for later, so I kept it on, sorry. Um, his wife believes that she's going somewhere after she dies. And Larry's response to, the, to that is, I hope he's right. I hope she's right, sorry. And we're going to come back to that idea that, uh, that you know, many non-Jews have a fervent belief that there is a world beyond this world. And, and we Jews, you know, we're, we're, we're not so sure. Uh, we're going to come back to that idea, especially in David Copperfield. But uh, Larry King was um, turned off to Judaism back in Hebrew school in, in Bensonhurst. Uh, he did not like the God of the Old Testament. And he's, he's very open about that. He thought that God was too harsh, too punishing, too vindictive. Uh, although he did feel that Moses was a genius coming up with the Ten Commandments, but feels that most of them really don't make sense today. I mean, after all, who doesn't covet? We all covet, uh, and he, I thought this was an interesting line. He said, I wouldn't want to share an afterlife 
with the God of the Old Testament. Uh, so I guess uh, Larry King has sort of a belief that there's something beyond this world, that he's not a religious Jew in any sense of the word, much more of a cultural Jew. He was raised kosher, so the thought of mixing milk and meat really makes him sick. Um, while growing up, his mom always lit Shabbat candles every week. Uh, there, oh, they, she put on a Seder every year. And they participated in the most quintessential Jewish custom of eating Chinese food every Sunday night. Now, if that doesn't make somebody Jewish culturally, I don't know what else does. He um, continues to observe Yizker, the memorial service on Yom Kippur. And uh, he's still not quite sure about God and calls himself a Jewish agnostic, meaning that, that again, maybe there's something. And that's sort of, you know, a, a prevalent attitude among Jews is that, um, you know, we, we're, we're just not sure, but we keep an open mind to things like God and the afterlife. And there's nothing definitive, uh, like in Christianity, where, my goodness, when you die, you absolutely believe you're going to a better place and God is going to protect you. And there's comfort in that. You know, we Jews are not so sure. And I'll never forget the woman in my previous a congregation years ago who said, oh, Rabbi, I don't, I don't know about Judaism. I, I have to have an afterlife. Uh, but so the, the, that comes up in with Larry King and a little bit about David Copperfield too. But uh, I, I guess the, the best answer is when a, a young child asked her mom where grandpa went when he died. She said, well, we don't know, sweetheart. Nobody's ever come back to tell us. And I think that's a good Jewish answer about the afterlife. We, we keep an open mind to it. All right, so um, his kids, Larry's, the kids he's had are being raised Mormon. And I'm gonna read you the first excerpt now from the book. Would it matter if his children ultimately don't call themselves Jews? And Larry's answer is, it wouldn't be the end of the world if they don't, but I'd like them to know that they're Jewish. Whenever we apply to schools, we list them as both Jewish and Mormon. I have three grown children too, a boy 47, another boy 40, and a daughter 35. The only one of the five who goes to the synagogue is the boy who's 40. He's raising his kids Jewish. I have five grandchildren. Three are being raised Jewish. King pauses for a moment. I just want my kids to be smart enough to learn for themselves and not be something by rote. I don't want to believe something just because my father believed in it. Well, that sounds awfully familiar, doesn't it, to some people we've studied in the past few weeks, particularly last week with uh, Stephen Breyer, the Supreme Court Justice, and Alan Dershowitz. Both of them allowed their kids the freedom to be what they wanted to be, and we see that idea uh, here with Larry King as well. Um, he suffered a, a tragedy with the loss of his father when he was only nine and a half years old, and that affected him very deeply. His father was a Russian immigrant who spoke fluent Yiddish, and um, his mother really never remarried. She raised Larry and his younger brother. His oldest brother, Erwin, died when, at age six uh, before Larry was even born. Um, and his father and brother are buried in Elmont, New Jersey. I'm sorry, Elmont, Long Island, near the Belmont racetrack, uh, which is appropriate since his father played the horses. But uh, Larry had a very hard time with his father's death. And um, he said Kaddish twice a day at the synagogue. Uh, nothing could keep him away from, uh, no all uh, adverse weather conditions would keep him from uh, joining the minion. His bar mitzvah was bare bones because his mother was destitute. He had no party. And uh, he laments about how long his haftarah was. Uh, with his peers, they would all compare, you know, who, had the, who got lucky enough to have the shortest haftarah and his was, uh, was quite lengthy, it was about two and a half pages. Growing up in Brooklyn, he didn't know what a Protestant looked like. His 90% of his friends were Jewish, and they formed a club called the Warriors. And uh, being from Flatbush, I always, uh, I, I guess it could have been a Jewish version of the Lords of Flatbush, if you remember that movie with uh, Sylvester Stallone. Uh, because there would be some, uh, there'd be some uh, tensions between various ethnic groups. The Italian kids would go up to the Jewish kids and accuse them of killing their Lord. And, uh, and it could, sometimes it could have led to fisticuffs. 
uh, until one of Larry's friends one day said, okay, we killed your Lord, but the statute of limitations is up. I see that's using brains and not just brawn. Uh, so he always, he laughs about that. Uh, he spoke a little bit about uh, his feelings towards uh, prejudice and bigotry. He writes, since I was a kid, I never understood prejudice. I always regarded it as stupid. It means to prejudge. I don't do it when I interview. I don't expect someone to be good or bad. To judge a people by what their religion or color happens to be is self-defeating. When I came to Miami the first time, I got off the train with $16 in my pocket to try to break into radio. And the first thing I saw were two water fountains. One said colored, one said white. I drank out of the colored. I sat in the back of the bus where blacks were supposed to sit. I've never had a rational explanation for bigotry. Hitler took away the best of his community. The Jews of Berlin were the symphonic maestros, the medical leaders. He chased Einstein out. It makes no sense to me. And uh, how, much, how much sense do, do his comments make in today's world of systemic racism? Still, uh, still very relevant uh, and, and important. Um, the, uh, uh, he changed his name when his uh, producer in Miami, who offered him his first job, said, okay, what are we going to call you, kid? And uh, he had no idea. He happened to see a newspaper open on the producer's desk. It was open to an ad that said, uh, King's Wholesale Liquor Sale. He said, you know what? King, I like it. I'll be Larry King. That's how he got his name. The quote I'm using uh, for, uh, and his start in radio was in back in 1957. So he, uh, he had quite a, a lengthy uh, career uh, in journal of broadcast journalism. His quote that I've selected is, I'm not a religious Jew, I am so, but I'm so culturally Jewish, which I have embellished with, although not a practicing Jew, Larry has a Jewish heart and feels a strong connection to things Jewish. So if we can uh, put up the uh, JIS for Larry King, um, because of his, uh, he really rejects religious identity and feels connected culturally. So we gave him 60% for that. And, uh, and if we can see the other categories, um, I, I gave him just a little bit of uh, points for Israel Zionism, because he, he does make a statement in there that he, he feels very strongly about uh, Israel and that it should, should survive. Uh, association for the fact that he had Jewish friends, so many Jewish friends growing up and I think relates uh, to, to Jewish people. He talks about the, the history. Uh, he's asked, do I want the Jews to survive? Of course. So I, he, got, he got a little bit of credit just for that one line. And the fact that he, uh, he really goes by the ethics and morals of, of our faith, or at least intimated that in, in the comments. So I gave him just a little bit uh, of credit for, for those four subjects. But mostly uh, he's a cultural Jew and that's what's reflected there. All right, any comments or questions about uh, Larry King or do we have Hi, any Rabbi. updates? Robin? Um, oh, Susan, did you want to go first? I had a couple, but go ahead. Okay, well, what I was going to say is that I read that in 2019 he filed for divorce from his, his eighth wife, well, it was actually his seventh wife, but he's been married eight times because he married the same woman twice. But I thought that was kind of surprising because I'd read something earlier how this was his last marriage and how he had planned to stay with her forever. So he also said that um, he wrote that I'm 80 years old and I still don't know what I want to be when I grow up, which I thought was kind of interesting. And he does have a program on Hulu. Robin? And I wanted to say that this has nothing to do with his Judaism, but he had an interview with um, uh, who was Roseanne Barr, and he said that he's never gotten used to the internet. He says it's, um, I wouldn't love it. What you do, you, what do you punch? Little buttons and things? This was in 2006. So it had already been around quite a bit. I couldn't find anything currently to say if he has embraced the internet, but he was not a believer that this was gonna go anywhere. So I just thought that was interesting. But, and I also found out that he had a, uh, 
had a heart attack and um, a near fatal stroke. Uh, and that he said that he is not afraid of dying anymore. Um, uh, I'm 86 and it is what it is. I just want to keep working until the end. I'd like to die at work. I'll retire right there. <laughs> um, when I came out of the stroke, I learned what had happened. I had an instant thought and I said to my son, I want to die. But what, that was just a passing thing. I had never thought it a bit about it again. Um, and my son kept me going. So um, that was his comment. So anyway, that's Larry King. But I mostly remember him for being married so many times and not believing the internet was going to catch on. Hey, and, and maybe he's not afraid of death because he's, uh, he's starting to have even more of a belief in the afterlife. Maybe, maybe he thinks he's going to a better place. Okay. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Any other comments before we uh, move on? It looks like Arlene has oh, Arlene. Arlene. Arlene, you'll have to unmute. Um, okay, I can't get rid of this. You're okay, good. can you sing? Good, okay. Larry King is a showman. He likes to be in the limelight and he's a celebrity and he likes young women. So, his choices reflect the kind of celebrity he is. He's not a real newsman. He's, you know, one of those celebrities who enjoys his being a celebrity. Okay. Thank you, Arlene. I'm going to conclude with one quote at the end of the chapter, which I thought was humorous. He said, I think also one of the most unique moments was when I addressed the graduating class of Columbia University, University Medical School. I stood up in the Columbia robes, I never went to college, and I said that I had this vision of my mother looking down, rubbing her eyes, looking again, and saying, he's a doctor. Every Jewish mother's hope, right? Let's move on to David Copperfield, America's most famous magician. Although uh, I think Shin Lim from America's Got Talent could give him a run for his money today. But David Copperfield has been awarded 21 Emmys with 38 nominations. He's been knighted by the French government, waxed at Madame Tussauds on postage stamps in four countries. He um, has walked through the Great Wall of China. He's made the Statue of Liberty disappear. His net worth is 875 million. Uh, 60 million of that earned in 2019 alone. And uh, he performed 654 shows at the MGM Grand in the 12 months ending in June. So he's, uh, he's still pretty, pretty active in his, uh, in his career. He was born David Seth Kotkin on September 16, 1956. He is, is 63 years old and he hails from Matuchin, New Jersey. I hope I got that right, if there are any uh, New Jersey natives. Um, he, um, he went to Hebrew school uh, four hours a week through his bar mitzvah, and he says, I hated it, of course. Did he tell his parents, here's an excerpt, did he tell his parents he wanted to stop? No, I didn't think it was an option. It was part of the program. But I'm happy for the experience now, and if I'm lucky enough to have children someday, I'll do the same thing for them, to give them a sense of purpose and place. Part of who I am is based on the fact that we're taught that we have to fight a little harder. We're constantly challenged. As a people, we're told no all the time. And you have to just believe in yourself no matter what's thrown at you. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna throw out a question to you. Uh, and the fact that, uh, okay, we Jews have to fight a little harder. All right, I, can, I, I think I can understand that. We're constantly challenged. But what does it mean as a people were told no all the time? What does that mean to you? Uh, 
Does that, that does that resonate in any way? How are how are the Jews told no? Any thoughts on that? We always have to fight a little harder. We're always challenged. So how have we been told no throughout history? Maybe he means um, the fight for the state of Israel. Maybe he means uh, quotas that were placed on Jews uh, in terms of college admissions in the middle part of the 20th century and before that. Uh, so we've been told no in terms of acceptance uh, in the general society. Maybe, maybe that's what he means. I guess we wouldn't really know until we asked him directly, but I thought that was an unusual state. Maybe, maybe the uh, no comes from, uh, it's not kosher. If it's not, you can't eat it because it isn't kosher. So uh, the no, the no uh, rings a lot around food. This ah. year, this year not eat, this year not allowed to eat. Okay, well, and that, yeah, you bring up the whole idea of, of, you know, in Judaism, there are a lot more thou shalt nots than thou shalts. And uh, you're looking within the tradition, yeah, there are a lot of things that we can't do uh, and, and told and, and that we're told not to do. So maybe, uh, maybe that's what he means by that, rather than being told no by the general society. Good point. I like or it also, I mean, it also could go way back in our history to when we were slaves and in Egypt. I mean, we oftentimes didn't have a lot of freedom and were constantly being told no. Right, or, or, or constantly being told what to do and being controlled by somebody else. Yeah, right. Good. Okay. I just, uh, that just stood out a little bit. All right, Arlene had a comment. Okay. Um, maybe this is far-fetched. My husband wants to be on the Zoom. Is that your comment? Okay. Yes, he distracted me. Okay. Um, this gets into the, the uh, there are different kinds of Jews, and the more orthodox are more noticeable. And that's where you see that going on now, that there, you know, anti-Semitism uh, um, reveals itself in, in, in New York. And, in Bedford, uh, in areas where the Orthodox are viewed with great scorn. And there are people who, do, a lot of people living in non -Jew, mostly non Jewish settings, like where I lived in Huntsville, Alabama, who do not know what a Jew is. There are people in Naples who do not know what a Jew is. They think our culture is strange. In fact, our neighbor asked us if we still do sacrifices. Not the first and not the last person who asks us that one. Yes. Robin? Robin? Yes. It's Bobby. Yes. Okay, I have a, I have a comment. Okay. Two things. Uh, Rabbi Mahler, uh, the name of the town that uh, <laughs> David Copperfield came from is called Matachin. Okay, not so bad. My kids, um, my kids knew him when he was living in the area, number one. And number two, when you mentioned about, he said no. If you remember in the Holocaust, all Jews, they were not allowed to do this. They no, they weren't allowed to have businesses. No, they weren't allowed to, you know, so those kinds of things, that's where maybe that no came from. Yeah, the restrictions imposed on from without. Yeah, very good. I mean, that makes no sense to say that. Um, yeah, I don't know how to pronounce that city, and I, but at least I didn't say Matuchen, uh, far too good. So. <laughs> it was perfectly fine. I, 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 I give you 10 points, not to worry. Okay, thank you. Thank you for very good. Um, David was very sick the night before the but he was so nervous he could hardly sleep. And uh, he dropped all observance of Judaism after his uh, bar mitzvah, even though his mother uh, was born in Israel and, and lived there for the first five years of her life. But he just had, as he describes it, he had no motivation to continue. Uh, he claims that he doesn't stick with things, which I find hard to believe because nobody can be as successful as he's been unless they have had uh, a great deal of stick to it. 
but uh, he does, uh, he admits that he dropped out of Fordham University after going to college for just three weeks. But 20 years later, he received an honorary doctorate. Uh, so here we go again, his Jewish mother's wishes were fulfilled, uh, getting that doctorate. And I, I found this extremely interesting. We're going to talk a little bit about the intersection of magic and Judaism and how uh, David relates to the, to the two of that. Here's from the book. Uh, the author, Abigail Pogrebin, I tell him I read an interview he gave the Cleveland Jewish News in which he related doing magic to being Jewish. What did I say in the article, he asks me. I read him this quote. We are taught throughout childhood not to take no for an answer. It is possible to turn no into yes. That is what magic is all about. Well, what does he mean by that? Copperfield looks at me. It's my quote, so you can use it again, he says with a smile. He grabs my list of prepared questions out of my hands. I'll say it again right here. He starts to reread his own quote aloud. I ask him if he could elaborate. I think every human being to a certain degree is persecuted, he says. We're taught in the Jewish culture the same story over and over again, whether it's in Fiddler on the Roof, the Holocaust, or the Maccabees, that we have to rise above persecution and do our best. Magic is about making people dream and taking impossible things and making them happen, taking things that aren't supposed to be and turning them into something beautiful. Houdini was a Jew. I'm a Jew. And this is the quote that I used for him. Uh, and I'll read it again. Magic is about making people dream and taking impossible things and making them happen. Well, I immediately, as soon as I you know, hear the word dream, I immediately think about Theodore Herzl, who said, Im tirtsu ein zo agada, if you will it, it is no dream, referring, of course, to the establishment of a state in the land of Israel for the Jewish people. That was as magical for us as, as the Statue of Liberty disappearing for David Copperfield. It was a modern day miracle that we were able to have our homeland established. And maybe that's what the kinds of things that he means throughout Jewish history. There have been impossible things that have happened that shouldn't have happened, including our very survival to this day. The fact that we Jews are still here, kind of like what Mark Twain said, you know, all these civilizations came and went, but the Jews have survived. And I, and I just love the way he connected that uh, with, with magic. You know, David Copperfield lives in two worlds. He lives in the world of reality and the world of magic. And, and again, I'm going to bring up the, the Olam, the, uh, the world to come and the afterlife. We Jews live in two worlds also. We live in the uh, Olam Hazeh, which is this world. And we also keep, we keep our thoughts focused on the Olam Haba, the world to come. And like I said, we don't have an overt belief that we're going somewhere better after this life is over, but we keep the possibility open. We're open to the suggestion that maybe there is something beyond this life, whether it's, it's, it's a physical existence or it's immortality of the soul. But I think it gives our people a lot of uh, a hope that sometimes we deny ourselves by, by you know, this, this idea that Judaism is only focused on this life and we have to do mitzvahs to improve this world and we don't expect any reward in the world to come. We don't know. And who knows? Uh, it could be a magical uh, existence beyond this world that is awaiting us. And, and that's what I love about uh, this idea coming out with the study of David Copperfield is that part of Judaism is magical. And I used to try to convey that to my confirmation students. I don't know if you ever saw the, the 3D book where if you stare enough at, at, the, at this, uh, these objects, in a, it's, it's, it's a picture that really uh, you can't see anything in it. But if you look at it long enough, it suddenly transforms into a 3D object. And I said, that's what Judaism is. It's, 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 if, if you study it long enough, you'll see the magic in our religion and our faith that a lot of people don't see because they stop their education after religious school and they have never learned about Judaism as an adult. So our faith has a lot of magic in it too. It's all there. All right. Um, David Copperfield feels a sense of otherness, if not overt anti-Semitism. And I will read a little passage here. All right. Um, if Danny Thomas was known as a Lebanese guy, I think we'd be focusing on that, Copperfield says. Casey Kasem, Arab guy. 
but it should be about his top 40 countdown. Winona Ryder, I think it's pretty cool that she's Jewish. Nice girl, really talented. I don't think it's a matter of hiding it, but not emphasizing it just allows people to focus on their work. I'm trying to think the people who are non-Jews that are famous, do we talk about their religions? Do we know what Halle Berry is? Uh, okay, I think I, I mixed this up a little bit. This, this was related to his question about um, should Jewish identity be brought into one's work? And, and he doesn't think so. He, he thinks that uh, your religion is irrelevant to, to the work that you do. And then if, 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 if anything, it's, it's just going to focus attention away from what you do by focusing on uh, your ethnic or religious background. Uh, let me read you the paragraph that I said earlier, that he feels a sense of otherness, if not overt anti-Semitism. I ask if he's ever thought about the nexus of being famous and Jewish. For me, I'm a little fearful sometimes if I'm in various countries that there will be a crazy person that will be a Jew hater and want to make a point. And I'm not trying to make any political stance. I'm just trying to help people dream and grow. So that crosses my mind. My parents are always a little bit nervous because I have shows everywhere in the world and I'm pretty popular in a lot of countries that are anti-Jew. Which countries? I don't really want to talk about that now. So clearly there's a little bit of uh, trepidation, perhaps whenever he goes abroad uh, or is in an environment which he feels he's not uh, that familiar with, that there could be, uh, there could be trouble ahead. So that must be a concern uh, that, that he has. He is definitely not comfortable being a symbol or spokesperson uh, for Jewish things or Jewish causes. He was engaged to the model Claudia Schiffer for six years in the 90s, but it ended in 1999. And uh, the author asked him, did being engaged to a German raise issues for him as a Jew? And his answer is, I speculate that planning a life with a German woman could have raised issues for someone Jewish. It didn't. It matters in one sense. I hope that when I settle down with somebody whom I can trust and trust me, that our children can be brought up Jewish and go through the same torture I had when I was a kid. <laughs> well, that's what we hear a lot of people say, uh, because I think it did me good at the end of the day. So he feels what, whatever he had to endure in, in his religious education, it somehow taught him uh, the hard knock lessons of life, and, and it, uh, it, was good, it was good for him in the end. Uh, so that is, uh, that's the uh, uh, information I wanted to impart about David Copperfield, and again, his quote, Magic is about making people dream and taking impossible things and making them happen, taking things that aren't supposed to be and turning them into something beautiful. Houdini was a Jew, I'm a Jew, which I embellished to, with his line, the Jewish people must rise above persecution and do our best in adverse conditions. So uh, we, gave, uh, we gave him association points uh, for his connection to, uh, to the, the Jewish community and that he wants to raise his children uh, Jewish. I, I don't know if he has, uh, I don't know what has been happening in the last 15 years, we'll hear about that in a second, if he ended up raising his children Jewish. Uh, that he's weary of uh, someone coming out to get him. Uh, there's definitely a sense of otherness and an awareness of anti-Semitism, so we gave him 35% for that. And the fact that he, uh, he feels it's so important for uh, Judaism to to survive and that we have to rise above the uh, the tumultuous uh, vicissitudes in our history and we have to carry on. We, we just have to be able to uh, to overcome the obstacles that, that we face in, in life as Jews. So that's the history and survival, 35%. All right, now we'll open it up. Who's got some information on I what do. David Copperfield has been doing in the last 15 years? I, I, I have... I have some information All right. about David Copperfield. Um, he was in high school. He was already performing, and he performed at my, um, my nephew's birthday party. Nice. And, and every, everybody was so thrilled. And my sister-in-law at the time said, he's going to be famous one day. So he really got a very early start. They lived in Edison, and he lived in Metuchen. That's what it is, Metuchen. Metuchen, okay. All right, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, I mean, with, with the kind of fame that he has, 
uh, and, and what he's done in his career. I'm sure he started out at, at, at a very young age. And he obviously knew what he wanted to do because it takes a lot of guts for a Jewish kid to drop out of college after three weeks, right? Okay. We're going to move on now to... Uh, Am I to, to answer yes. your question? Anyone else? Um, and he became engaged in 2014 to a French model, and the two of them already had a three-year-old daughter. And um, as of 2019, they still weren't married, but I think they might have three children. And I read a quote from him that he said that being Jewish is an important part of who he is for better or for worse. And he said, I have a personal relationship with God and I pray a lot and my kids go to Hebrew school. So I guess that he is raising his children Jewish. He also commented, which I thought was interesting, if I had to do it over again, I might not pick Copperfield because I now view Charles Dickens as anti-Semitic. All right, maybe Copperstein? <laughs> okay, thank you. All right, uh, I, I saved what I think is the, is the most interesting for the last. And, um, and again, I mean, not all of us may be aware of, of Katie Martin and what she's accomplished, but she certainly has an, an unbelievably compelling story. And so we're gonna spend uh, the bulk of our time on, on her for the rest of, of the session. All right, well, who, who is Katie Martin? Uh, she, is, uh, she was born in Budapest, Hungary, February 3rd, 1949. And her career has included reporting for ABC News as a foreign correspondent and National Public Radio, where she started as a production assistant in 1971, as well as print journalism. And she's written about nine books, uh, many of them on Jewish subjects. And, uh, and several of them on non-Jewish subjects, but uh, she has written some, some really interesting titles uh, based on, on what we're gonna find out about her, her story uh, in, just, uh, in just a couple of minutes. But uh, she's written uh, a book about every three or four years since 1982. Her last book was published in 2016, so uh, maybe, she, uh, maybe we're due for another one. She is uh, 73 years old. Uh, today. She was born in uh, 1949, I believe. All right, um, so let's, uh, let's give you some background. Her parents were Andre and Ilana Martin. She was married to Peter Jennings from 1979 to 1993, and they had two children, Elizabeth and Christopher Jennings. So uh, right away, you, you, uh, not too many uh, Jewish parents name their children Elizabeth and Christopher. So right there, you know, a kind of uh, an eyebrow is raised as to what her, her background is. She, uh, she was uh, married to Richard Holbrook, the um, American uh, diplomat and ambassador from 1995 to 2010, uh, when he uh, passed away sadly at the age of 69. Um, so the, uh, uh, and she and her second husband, uh, were quite the, they were, uh, they were quite the, uh, the high profile New York couple in Central Park West. Um, they, uh, hosted star studded parties with famous politicians and actors, uh, like Bill Clinton, Robert De Niro, and uh, Richard Holbrook had dated Diane Sawyer for seven years. She had been married to Peter Jennings. So uh, they, they had some, uh, some star power there. Um, she is, uh, the, the interesting part of her story is that she didn't know she was Jewish until she was 30 years old, stumbling onto a staggering personal discovery while reporting a story as a rising correspondent for ABC News and living in London uh, with her husband and two children who were very young at the time. And um, I, I struggled with this, you know, to, to, try, to try to summarize her story, but you really can't, you know, to, to get the full impact of this, you, you have to hear it in her own words. So there, there's gonna be a, a little bit more reading uh, about her than we've done from some of the other uh, individuals we've talked about. All right. Um, it started in 19, the story starts in 1978 when she was on assignment and returned to her home country of Budapest doing a, a five-part series called Budapest Revisited. 
That began my reclamation of my personal history because in the two decades prior to that time, I had hardly ever looked back. I was so busy becoming the all-American girl and fulfilling my parents' highest expectations. I'd been very forward-looking and focused. Martin's family barely escaped Hungary's communist crackdown in 1957 when she was eight years old. She had previously lived through two harrowing years while her parents, Andre and Alana Martin, were imprisoned by their government for alleged communist activity. When they were taken away, she and her sister were sent to live with a guardian they'd never met. Once the family started anew in America, there was little talk of the past. It was during that trip to Budapest for ABC that I picked up the story of Wallenberg, Martin continues. She's speaking of Raoul Wallenberg, the Swedish diplomat who, despite incalculable risk, saved thousands of Hungarian Jews from Adolf Eichmann's scourge in 1944. I passed a street named Wallenberg Street, and I just had this vague recollection of hearing something about Wallenberg. So I called my father in Washington and said, tell me everything you know about him. He said, well, I don't know too much. Your mother and I were underground during the war, but here are three names of people who would. Martin began to track down Wallenberg intimates all over Europe and Russia. One day I was doing this interview with this woman in Budapest, a friend of my father's, who had been saved by Wallenberg. And she just very matter-of-factly said, of course, Wallenberg arrived too late for your grandparents. Martin knew at once that this woman was talking about her maternal grandparents, about whom she'd been told very little. I'd never seen a picture of my maternal grandparents and knew nothing about them, except that they were killed during the siege of Budapest in 1945, the last stand between the advancing Soviets and the retreating Nazis. The city was reduced to rubble by these two forces and a lot of people died. So the story that was told to me of my parents, of my mother's parents' deaths was entirely plausible. I never had reason to question it. So when this woman said Wallenberg arrived too late for your grandparents, I was dumbstruck. But I thought if I said, what do you mean? I would be disloyal to my parents because clearly they had not seen fit to share this with me. So I didn't ask. Well, that is really something. She was raised Roman Catholic in her native Hungary and never missed a Sunday mass as a little girl. So she was rather devout as a, devout as a child. She had a special relationship with the uh, Virgin Mary after her parents' arrest in the 1950s because her godmother taught her a prayer for political prisoners, which she uttered many times each day. When her parents were released, her father after two years, her mother after one, she truly believed she had interceded with the higher powers in heaven who brought it about. And here we come to our second excerpt when she confronted her father in 1978 martin was angry i was young and very judgmental she says and rather harsh in expecting them to just put everything on the table for me which they really couldn't do i now understand why it was very difficult for them to talk about this because i've since experienced this reluctance so many times with other people who also lived through this almost unprecedented hell the last six months of the war in budapest Budapest had gotten off pretty lightly until then. Everybody knew the war was over and thought they had survived the worst, but then Eichmann came in. It happened with such breathtaking speed that it left those people really in permanent post-traumatic shock. They lost their identity. They lost their status in a country where they had all those things heretofore, particularly in Budapest. So the, you have to understand in, in Budapest, the middle class uh, was was predominantly Jewish, and the Jewish community that comprised the middle class were almost entirely assimilated. Uh, Katie's parents were, were were Christians, and they were already the second generation that had abandoned Judaism. Her father had never even been inside a synagogue. Uh, they thought of Judaism as a religion and not a race, and for a while, so did the Hungarian government. But how quickly this had changed when Eichmann arrived. Her father was overnight stripped of his prestige, let alone his humanity. He had been part of the Budapest upper middle class establishment. He had a PhD in economics from the University of Budapest, and suddenly he was a nobody. He no longer could sit on a park bench 
And here we come back, I guess, to the nose that, uh, that Bobby had mentioned. Uh, he couldn't sit on a park bench. He could not date a non-Jewish woman. Uh, and he never even considered himself Jewish. But you know the rule that Hitler used. One Jewish grandparent is all it took. These revelations left Martin feeling unmoored and bitter that such essential information had been kept for, from her. So what did I do? I wrote a novel using large chunks of my own childhood and fragments from theirs, because this is how a writer resolves this kind of identity crisis. The novel, An American Woman, published in 1987, centered on a foreign news correspondent named Anna, who in the course of reporting a story stumbles upon her Jewish past. At one point, the character says, this must be like finding out at age 36 that your parents aren't your real parents. And about her father, he had lived a lie for her. He had sculpted himself into the embodiment of everything Anna thought Jews were not, aloof and indifferent to the past and to any God. Well, Katie actually had that conversation with her father. Uh, needless to say, her parents did not react favorably to the novel An American Woman. At first, she was angry, feeling as though she had been deprived of her own birthright. But years later, she understood why her parents did what they did. They wanted to shield their daughter from the horrors of what they had experienced. They were scarred for life, and they didn't want to burden Katie with their own trauma. She was to live a normal life in America, free from persecution. And her parents were in their 90s when, uh, when Stars of David was written 15 years ago. And over the course of her entire life, Katie never saw her mother mourn for her parents. She couldn't talk about it, and she resented her daughter's need to talk about it as if it were none of her business. Well, Ilana Martin had survivor's guilt, although there was nothing she could have done to save her parents. This poor woman never went to bed without a sleeping pill after her parents were killed. And for another excerpt, despite Martin's distress at learning her true biography so late in life, she regrets putting it in writing. I think if I had to do it over again, I wouldn't have done the novel, she confesses. I didn't expect the novel to upset them so much, but at the time I was so full of the story, so full of my past, I felt that there was a discrepancy between the person I was conveying to the world and the person inside me. There was just a big yawning gap between this successful network correspondent married to the anchor monster and the mother of beautiful children and this person who was me, who wasn't quite sure who she was. Everyone else seemed more defined than I was and I wanted some of that definition. Part of finding it was to write Wallenberg Missing Hero, her first nonfiction book, the culmination of following the Swedish diplomat's trail from his home country uh, in Sweden to Hungary to Russia, where the man considered the quintessential savior of Jews, the ultimate righteous Gentile, was ultimately incarcerated, never to be heard from again. Katie's parents were proud of the Wallenberg book, but not happy with the dedication that she chose, which was in memory of her grandparents. The book said, to the memory of my grandparents, for whom Raoul Wallenberg arrived too late. They felt it was an invasion of privacy, so she generalized it to uh, the memory of those Hungarians for whom Raoul Wallenberg arrived too late. But clearly, it was intended to honor her grandparents. And she it was very hard for her to change that dedication, but she did it out of respect for uh, her parents. She had the luxury of celebrating her newfound heritage in a safe environment, and she felt that was the least that she could do for them. And uh, she also mentions uh, Madeleine Albright in, in this story, and it was, it's very interesting. There's so many parallels between Madeleine Albright's story and Katie Martin's. Even though Madeleine Albright was from Czechoslovakia, uh, she too was raised as a Roman Catholic, became an Episcopalian, um, uh, her parents were, were also persecuted for uh, communist activity, and, uh, and, she, and her grand, three of her grandparents were killed in the camps. So the parallels between her story and Katie Martin is really is quite striking. Um, all right. Um, the passage of time has calmed her obsession. 
Katie became much more understanding and tolerant of her parents' feelings. She actually became their caretaker in their old age. Her mother died a few months after the interview with Abigail Pogrebin in September of 2004. Her father passed away a little over a year later in November 2005, a month after Stars of David was published in October of that year. And her parents eventually regretted the choice they made in trying to cover everything up. They just never wanted to look back because the Hungarian Holocaust was so uniquely terrible. Uh, let me read you just this little uh, excerpt. I'm wondering if my parents wouldn't sleep better if we would have dealt with it early, says Martin. But they are sort of pre-Freudian, pre-analysis. Their way of dealing with pain is not to touch it. And of course, we always have to remind ourselves that being who they were was life-threatening. And therefore, I am much less pious and judgmental today than I was 20 years ago. Um, okay. So, uh, she has, and she has learned from her parents' mistake, which she vowed not to repeat with her own children. No more mysteries. The kids were raised as Christians, but they've been to Budapest to see what Katie calls the Stations of My Cross, where she lived, where she and her sister lived when her parents were arrested, where the family hid during the revolution at the American embassy, where she and Richard Holberg were married. Over the years, she wrote books on subjects other than her heritage, uh, which we will hear about from Arlene in, in just a moment. Despite the fixation, or I'm sorry, but the, the fixation lingers. In 2002, she visited her grandparents' hometown of Miskolc, Hungary, the fourth largest city in that country. She wrote a forceful op-ed piece for the New York Times. I have come to this place in search of the grandparents I never knew or some memory of their world, she wrote, going on to describe her frustration at not meeting any townspeople who could direct her to the old synagogue, even those who worked across the street. Finally, she manages to find it. The interior wall of the courtyard is crowded with marble plaques honoring the innocent people who were deported in the most brutal and dehumanizing manner. The language is strong, even moving. But who sees these plaques behind locked gates? Not the people in the pub across the street, not those at the McDonald's a few blocks away, certainly not young Hungarians. As I walk the bleak, the bleak streets of Miss Kolk, I scan the faces of passers-by. Where were you? Where were your parents? What did you do before, during, or after the disappearance of one quarter of your town's population? Were your parents my grandparents' neighbors? I feel slightly ashamed for thinking that these people share a collective guilt, but I cannot help it. The town of Miss Kolk has buried its past and so cannot expect redemption. Some story, I told you. Finally, she's asked by the author, does she feel Jewish now? And here's her answer. I certainly feel that who I am has definitely been shaped by these historic experiences. I'm only one generation from that. I see things in myself, my drive, my need to keep doing good works, the fact that I can never relax. I'm very happy, I love my life, but I can never say, okay, I'll take a year off now and have lunch with my friends and go skiing. I'll never be able to do that. I think that was born of these genes and the need to eternally prove myself worthy of my good fortune. I'm so damn lucky and I want to without sounding pious. I think I have a need to earn that good fortune. And whenever something really great happens to me, a good book review or getting on the New York Times bestseller list with the last book, there's always a little voice in me that says, she whispers, that's for you, Grandma. Well, that's that's the story, and you know, she she doesn't really do anything overtly Jewish. Uh, the fact that she even says my need to keep doing good works. Well, good works is a Christian term. You know, when we talk about it, we say doing mitzvot or or you know doing doing good deeds. But good works is particularly Christian, and I think that's from her her uh, her background being raised Roman Catholic. So I, I really couldn't, this is an unusual JIS because there aren't the typical categories of, of, of cultural identity or, or history survival. Uh, well, okay, the, well, there is history survival, sorry. Uh, but the usual uh, uh, categories of, of culture, association, uh, anti-Semitism, even that. She, she was so embedded in her family's history that that's, we had to give her 50% for that. And, um, and the tradition and heritage that she was handed down from her grandparents. 
you know, she's so focused on her parents and grandparents and what they went through. So I didn't know how else to plot her Jewish identity. That's what I came up with. Uh, maybe some of you have other ideas, but we're going to turn it over uh, to Arlene now in the last five minutes to give us the update on uh, what Katie Martin has been doing for the last 15 years. Um, I can't get out of this. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, I can't find the picture. Uh, am I on? Yes, you are. I just, uh, I'm blocked here. It shows the Jewish identity spectrum. Oh, here I am. Okay. This picture, can you see this picture? Hold it up this, higher. This, uh, these are his, her parent, grandparents. Can you no, see you it? Can't. No, you're no. Okay. Um, it's a, li a little confusing. Her grandparents died during World War II. They were exterminated in Auschwitz, and that's what she carries with her. Yeah, yeah. The fact that her grandparents were killed just because they were Jewish. And the whole history of the Holocaust haunts her. Now her parents were um, were um, jailed because later during the communist era, because they were suspected of being CIA agents. Now um, there's something interesting too about her her um, her relationship with Ellie Wazell. Somebody else is talking. We're good. Go ahead. Okay, um, um, Martin spoke in uh, Moment magazine about this, discovering her family's Jewish roots. This is her legacy that she's passing on, free rights, uh, social, um, social, um, uh, justice. This has been her whole thrust of her journalism, that the persecution and the extermination of minorities all through the world. And um, she said in this article, Ellie and I met in the Grand Synagogue in Stockholm in 1981. Um, I had just come from Budapest discovering I'd been raised as a Roman Catholic. And uh, I found that my parent, grandparents were Jewish and in Paris, in perished in Auschwitz. And she met Ali Wiesel by uh, chance and told him this story. I was shocked that my parents, who I absolutely reveal, had within something so important. We all carry El different ideas of Ellie in my head, but my Ellie was not surprised by anything having to do with human beings. He was beyond surprised. I told him about my parents. They were the only journalist writing about the ter awful atrocities that were unfolding in Soviet-occupied Hungary. Ali just gave me a wonderful shrug and said that things are strange about human nature. Quote, Katie, they survived. Because they survived, you are here. Don't be hard on them. What was your reaction to your parents' decision to not tell you about your Jewish heritage? The, the uh, reporter asked. I felt that I had lost something in not having the Jewish faith and tradition, but I think much of the work I do beyond my writing is my way of fulfilling important aspects of that heritage and of being a good human being. Ellie Weisel was helpful recon reconciliating me to my parents' choices as was my husband, Richard Holbrook, the world's greatest negotiator, negotiated a truce between me and my parents. And um, there are two wonderful articles about her written in, uh, by the way. Um, All right, we're, we're running out of time, Arlene. Can you uh, wrap it up? Okay, she uh, wrote a book about um, nine Jewish survivors uh, who fled who survived World War II. Um, she is actively involved in saving people's lives. So she has the concept to save a Jewish life, to save a life which we Jews have. 
she's not Jewish. She never was Jewish, but she feels the tug of her grandparents perishing in Auschwitz. And I think that's a, that's a, some, you made some great points and especially, you know, her connection with Ellie Wiesel, you can't, you can't meet Ellie Wiesel and, and not have a social justice component to your life. So yeah, knowing that I would probably adjust the, the, the spectrum and give her, give her a few points for social justice uh, connection, especially if she's writing about it. Can I just quickly Thank you. say Thank you, something? Arlene. Can I just quickly say something? Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Go ahead. Yeah. I, I, this is Judith Price. I am from Budapest, Hungary myself. And my parents have done something very similar to Katie Martin's parents. They bought, <coughs> at the end of the war, they bought papers to show that we are Roman Catholics. And it was very common among upper class um, European um, uh, people uh, in Budapest. And the minute the Russians came in and the war was over, my father tore up the papers and I was brought up Jewish, and I went to the synagogue and all that, but it was very common to do that for um, middle class, upper middle class Jewish uh, uh, residents to buy these papers and to show that they're not Jewish, they're Catholic. So it's not uncommon what her parents did. And I was saved by Wallenberg. My mother was in one of these Wallenberg safe homes where I wouldn't be here today if not for Raoul Wallenberg. Wow. So this story must have sent shivers up your spine. Wow. Well, I read some of her books before, so I'm familiar with her story. Yeah. I forgot the name of the, the, the title of the books, but I just read not too recently about her life. So I'm, I know I'm familiar with her and her, and her story. Yeah, her, her books are, are incredible. I mean, uh, just the titles alone are so compelling. And Rock Peter Jennings was an anti-Semite. I don't know if anybody knew that, but... Uh, I don't think they. I don't think they divorced because of that. But he was a real anti. He didn't like Jews at all. So oh. Peter Jennings. Wow. Uh, I actually, when he discovered that she was partly Jewish, I, I think he saw that as a kind of an exotic oddity, as, as she describes it. So right. anyway, I know right. I know we're out of time. Thank you all so okay. much for your comments. Right. Uh, uh, Susan, Robin, any final thoughts? Um, Jess, we look forward to seeing you next week, where we'll talk about Joan Rivers. Morley Safer and William Shatner. And thank you all for logging on. Thank you. All right. See you next time. <laughs>